Welcome everyone. My name is Stephanie Ivick. I'm the Content Marketing Manager here at eLearning Brothers. We have a really great webinar for you today, but first I'm going to go over a few housekeeping items. We are recording this and you will receive a copy of the recording via email to the email address you used to register. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, feel free to put them in the questions panel. We will get to as many as we can but if we run out of time, we will do our best to follow up with you offline afterwards. Joining me today are Craig Weiss, Christian Weeble, and John Toda. John Toda, I'll kick it over to you to do the introductions and start us off. All right, well, thank you, Stephanie, and thank you everyone for joining us today for this webinar. Uh, I wanna welcome you to this really unique panel discussion, probably a little bit different than some of the other webinars that you joined. Um, we've got two of the top minds in the online education space, Craig Weiss and Christian Weebel. I'm John Toda, the Rockstar Learning Evangelist here at eLearning Brothers, and I'll be your host for today's discussion on the future of the learning experience. We're going to be diving deep into topics ranging from what makes an LXP different than an LMS, how new methodologies for acquiring and managing content will change our learning and development practices, and finally, what Craig and Christian think about future learning model, the future learning model and what it's gonna look like going forward. So for any of you who don't already know uh, our two panel guests here, Craig Weiss uh, is one on, uh, well, he's on my left here. Uh, you're gonna be in a, a, a really in for a treat here with Craig. He's one of the most well-versed and outspoken thought leaders in the industry. Craig also left the big city and made his way to the Southern Arizona desert along with his three dogs, Voodoo, Kelly, and Spirit, if I got that right. He spends his time recording and writing about the local javelina population, many of which visit him daily. I just got quite a bit of an education on, on the javelina population. And uh, Craig then spends the rest of his time speaking to all of us in the industry about all things e-learnings, including market trends, content, and new technology. Christian, of course, is the Chief Product Officer here at eLearning Brothers, and he's the author of The Seven Principles of Learning. He's also served in several executive technology roles for some of the biggest software companies in the world and several fast-growing startups. So he's seen the online education model really done at the highest level with some of the biggest companies out there, but then also having implemented L&D programs on very limited budgets for startups. So we can learn a ton from both of these uh, these experienced thought leaders with us today, and we're going to really talk and dive deep into learning experience. So let's get into it. I'm going to start with you, Christian, an easy one for you, uh, and one that we get asked all the time. What is a learning experience platform, or LXP, and how does it differ today from the traditional learning management system, or LMS, that we're all familiar with? So Christian, uh, kick us off with that. Yeah, I, I think it's important to recognize that um, Things that, that seem to be new oftentimes have a precedent that goes way back. In this case, some of the principles of a learning experience platform have been implemented and have been uh, you know, driven forward by people inside of organizations for you know, at least two decades. However, it's something that's you know, now becoming a lot more common. And so I, I think of it in, in terms of two categories. Uh, learning management system is typically what you're going to use to deliver traditional top-down assigned learning. A lot of times that's going to be things like safety training, certification training, onboarding, uh, things that are coming from HR. Uh, an LXP, the learner experience platform, is focused more on learner-centered, self-directed learning. So it's giving people the opportunity to uh, find content that's relative, relative to their interests or relative to their needs, and, and then self-enroll or add, you know, save that content, add it to some type of a social board that they can share with others and uh, really kind of drive their own learning. So fundamentally, I think the difference is, you know, traditional top-down versus learner-centered and self-directed. Great. Good. And, and Craig, for you, this distinction between an LMS and LXP, are they truly mutually exclusive or is there this model going forward where we're going to be looking at more of a hybrid or a combination model? What's what's your feeling on the on the future between these these two acronyms that we all use every day? Sure. Um, I think that uh, in the at the end of the day, and it's it's clearly going this trend is they're going to be um, pretty much close to one another. There'll be a combo. I think that. 
the original premise of what the LXPs were, which was learner centric, is totally just, it's no longer happening. They put in assigned learning. And uh, this is because they heavily focused on the L&D market from the get go, where they were using the LMS predominantly, there's always outliers, predominantly for uh, assigned learning. And uh, they didn't go after the training market, which is tends to actually, as a whole, allow people to pick their own stuff. They'll have some assigned, um, but they don't always just focus on that. And they play heavy on the customer ed side, too. So as a result, uh, it was inevitable that the LXPs would have assigned learning and it would be inevitable that you would see compliance. And as a result, when you think about it, they started adding LMS functionality, even though they kept and they continue to say, we're not an LMS, we're not an LMS, but they start adding functionality. They bring in a classroom management. They do event management today. Um, some are getting into e-commerce. So, you know, what they'll spin it as is they may say, we have LMS light functionality or some kind of, you know, spin. It's spin. And then on the LMS side, where they're always really going after the LXPs and starting to add more of these kind of functionality like the playlist and whatnot, now they're saying, well, we have an LXP component or we have a suite and there's an LXP piece. And so what ends up happening, this is what why it creates mass confusion and because they've become very ubiquitous. And I think it's going to continue down the path. And, and so an LXPs were, for an example, Degreed was the very first LXP in the market. And even today, they don't call themselves that anymore. They either say they're an upscaling platform, but internally, they're really what I call a TXP, which is talent development where learning has to be a course. So it's not just about a TMM system. And then they have obviously the LXP functionality. And, and you know, there's really like three vendors that do this today. And that will continue to grow. And so that's the differentiator. And uh, But other than that, this is where you create the confusion of, uh, of why people get confused. And that's why they try to compete in LMS versus an LXP. They probably, you probably see this in RFPs and whatnot. And uh, each of the vendors, those approaches do a very good job, I think, of trying to confuse people when in reality, they're, they're nearly very close and they will continue to merge more and more um, and not so be so exclusive. Yeah, and, and I think so what you hit on, and you say this to us all the time, is that there's a distinction between the, the user base, training versus learning and development. And I think our audience here is probably mixed. Some people really relate more to that training you know role versus learning and development so christian i, I want to flip that to you as a vendor in the industry with e-learning brothers are you collectively trying to deliver products and services for the the training side or the learning development side or are you tr or are you trying to reach both of them now yeah you know so as a as a driving when i'm driving vision and strategy for product and thinking about kind of the business side of things it's of course important for us to understand the needs of each, the unique needs that both have, but it's also critical that we deliver a technology solution that meets both of those needs. And so I, I would say that our solution is really uh, broad in the sense that it can be used by uh, both training as well as L&D. And, and I know that in my conversations with Craig, one of the things that he's mentioned quite a bit is that the future is really designing an ecosystem that what we should be delivering to those end learners and the administrators who support them is an ecosystem to create content. So Christian, how does that style of thinking change the way in which content is created for the learning platform in the future? And are, is the vision now to kind of incorporate all of these tools and platforms in one so it's easier for people to access all of them and make it, make it available or just kind of like pick and choose whatever you want and they should all work together. What's what's the vision on that going forward? Yeah. So, you know, looking back historically at a learning management system and the, the fact that primarily the, the content that was being created is being assigned uh, top down, uh, it was a fairly limited set of people that were creating that content and distributing that content. 
And uh, at eLearning Brothers, one of our, uh, our tools is Lectora, the most powerful eLearning authoring tool on the market today for those who you know, have that level of development experience to be able to go in and really want to be able to customize and create um, highly configurable learning. Uh, and we also, but we also have Scenario VR, which is a very easy to use immersive learning tool to create virtual or augmented reality learning. Uh, and then we also have the Training Arcade, which is a, a templated games. So the games with the artworks, you can customize it, but it's got some artwork that's in there. You can take a game template, you can put in your own content and, and easily create that. Those are, are typically used um, kind of in that first model, in the in sort of the top-down approach. Somebody's creating that content and delivering it to the learners. As we're seeing this general transition and there's more attention on learner experience, self, self-directed learning, uh, there's not only a need for uh, learners to drive consumption and sharing of the content, but they're also creating it. Uh, and so we've that's a place that we are also providing a solution with a built-in authoring tool inside of our Rockstar Learning Platform, which can be used by authors and administrators to create content and assign it top-down, but it can also be used by learners to share directly with each other inside of channels. And so, Craig, I want to kick that back to you because you obviously, in your role, working with so many different technology providers in the space, both on the platform side and the authoring side and a combination of both. Do you see a vision going forward that the authoring tools that we've all been using to this point are soon to be extinct and replaced by built-in tools that the end users can more easily use? What, what's, your, what's your perspective on that? I think uh, it's a duality. First and foremost, I don't think the authoring tools are ever gonna disappear, Um, but there is a clear um, separation, if you will, between certain vendors and everybody else. Um, So that's kind of a problem uh, as a whole. It's good for them, of course, but everybody else, not necessarily. I think that it's very clear there has been cyclical with built-in authoring tools. They were very popular in the early to mid 2000s to about 2010, and then vendors stopped as a whole adding them or having them built in, and now it's it's returning. And I believe this is um, very much so, I think, the reality. And here's why it's very clear. Look, the rapid content authoring tools, which is an articulate, no offense, lector, lector and whatnot, were really designed for, if you think of studio, studio was designed for anybody to take a PowerPoint and convert it, right? It's very basic. And then you have Storyline and Lectora and, and Domino and, you know, Captivate. And they're designed for both somebody that's, simp- you know, basic, has no skills versus somebody who is a developer and has an instructional designer, really take it to that full level. And so built an authoring tool, that's what they were designed for. So, you know, when you had authorware, you had to have those skills. That was a requirement. If you didn't have those skills or Dazzler Max, you were in a world of trouble. And so these were designed so that anybody, fast forward, the built-in authoring tools are not designed, uh, again, there's outliers, but as a whole, they're not designed for somebody who has instructional design skills and somebody that has e-learning development. And that's a key. It's designed for you to build content quickly and get it out the door. And yes, you can add some interactions depending what it is, but the idea that you're going to create a, you know, a very robust, interactive, engaging course with a built-in authoring tool, again, there's outliers, is not, it's not doable. They're not designed for that because that's not their focus as the vendors as a whole. So some will connect uh, with a, a cloud-based, you know, tool to get through there to sort of offset that. But I believe that these are designed for anybody. You're a salesperson. Now you have to create courses or content. You're doing this built-in authoring tool. You're a trainer, you're an instructor-led or whatever. You've never built, you have to. You're an HRIS and you have to build these courses or HR and your company got rid of L&D or training, whatever. So it's for anybody to create something. Yes, there's a lot of PowerPoint. Yes, there's what I call a lot of static. Is it great? I'll be honest, no, it's not great. And this is also kind of a problem, right? Because your learners look at this and they go, yuck, 
this is an interactive this is yes i can stick a video on there but a video is i can look at youtube what do i need to use this for so i think that there are significant minuses but you know the days and many of the audience there will only be a few i think or some that will remember the days of you know you going third party and having somebody build the content per se or you going and building it yourself with storyboards a course a strong course would take six to nine months now you can create a course in under 15 minutes if you know what you're doing that's doing the basics and that's reality so that's where I see the authoring tool market. You're never, if you're a hardcore fan of Storyline, which there are a lot, and Lectora, and you know some of these others, you're never gonna leave that product, no matter what. But the idea that somebody can take, you know, if you're studying instructional technology, or you have strong instructional design skills, or e-learning development skills, you are not gonna be enthralled about using these built-in authoring tools, and then what do you got, you know, what's your option? You've got to pay for that. And plus the built-in authoring tools typically are included at no charge. So, yeah. you know, you're, you're taking the, these, um, you know, splits. And then the final piece is that I self-taught myself instructional design. Um, uh, but I find today as a whole, people just don't want to do that. They don't want to learn basic instructional design. And I admit, you, you have to go past first page of Google to find this stuff and really dive into it. And I, I honestly believe it is the responsibility of vendors, um, both the ones that have, especially LMS and uh, learning system vendors. If you have a built-in authoring tool, it is now your responsibility to show some basic instructional design skills that are applicable in today's workplace. So you're not doing Bloom Taxonomy, which I see, or hybrid Addy, which like nobody was using, or, you know, Gagney and some of these, people don't care. They really yeah. don't care. And so you're going for a very, you know, minority of folks that do that. And uh, to me, that's the responsibility. Otherwise, you're gonna continue to get what you see, which I find, and I saw this in Saudi Arabia, where somebody was very unhappy about their learning system. And as I drilled down with her, it came down really to the content. The people hated the content, ergo, they hated the system. So, yeah, I, I, and I totally get where you're coming from. It's painting a picture of this new world where we're gonna have high-end content getting produced by the instructional design team using these high-end tools. But then we wanna introduce this, in essence, the democratization of content creation that anybody at any level can create it. So I'm gonna kick it back to you, Christian, on this because I know this is something you talk about a lot. Now that you've got all these new content creators, like Craig was saying, at all different levels, subject matter experts in your company and all around it, now you've got content, like Craig said, coming in designed by non-professional uh, content creators who are all doing things in a different style. How does one manage that efficiently without turning the platform into a, a, a a dump site, if you will, or some complete mess of different styles of content. What's what's some of the strategies for that? Yeah. So uh, it probably wouldn't be surprising to you to know that when I was a kid, I liked to go out in the backyard and play in the dirt and play with the hose. There's something about water and there's something about dirt that just gets kind of fun when you're a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I had a chance to do a lot of experiments. I'd run the hose and try to create a swimming pool. I'd dig, you know, dig myself a little hot tub and fill it up. Um, but what I, what I really found fascinating was if I went out into the dirt before I turned the hose on and I took a stick or I took a rock or I took a little shovel and I kind of carved out where I wanted that water to go, I could get it to follow a pattern. I could get it to follow a line. I could get it to follow a curve line. I was able to get it to drop you know, from one terrace level to another. And so with a little bit of planning and structure, I could outline where I wanted this water to go and then uh, and, you know, carve that into the dirt. And then I go put the hose at the, the beginning of it and turn it on. And uh, sure enough, the water would follow. Now I had to have trenches that were deep enough, you know, and had the capacity for the flow of water that was coming in. But then it would go where I wanted it to go. And, you know, that same principle is used in uh, different types of irrigation on farms. You know, if you want to get water all the way to the end of the row, you got to make sure that your trenches are clean and clear and so that it can flow. 
Uh, similarly, um, I've, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of cross to another experience I had and then come back to that analogy. Uh, I was working at a high-tech software development company uh, over several products, and we were in a position where uh, the executive team was cutting costs, and they'd let the trainers go, they'd let the instruct instructional designers go, and so we had nobody doing training, we had nobody creating new content, we had a lot of old content that was sitting around, um, but these were pretty um, complicated technical products, and they were changing pretty frequently. And so that content was getting out of date very quickly. And so one of the things I did was I took on an, an initiative to say, how can I solve this problem? I don't have an instructional design team. I don't have budget. But uh, what can I do to be able to meet the needs of our learners? And our learners were other employees in the organization, like the guys who were doing technical support. It was our field, uh, our, our field agents who were going out, our field engineers who were going out on site and implementing that technology in customer sites. Uh, it was our partners who were trying to resell, uh, and it was our customers who were trying to use it. So I said, all right, I've got no budget. I have no team. What can I do? Um, I did have one UX senior UX design position that was available. And so I, I took that and I divided it into two positions um, uh, using the same budget that was available for that headcount. And I created one senior instructional designer position. And then I hired a UX designer um, into the other one. With that one person, I was then able to start addressing some of the needs that we had to keep, you know, keep training moving, uh, keep producing new content. But, but there was no way that she could keep up. She was really good, but she just couldn't keep up. There were too many products, too many changes coming over time. And so um, the process that she was going through is she would sit down with our subject matter experts. Sometimes that was the developer. Sometimes it was the product manager. Sometimes it was our, our, our field engineer who really knew the technology and knew what this new thing was. She would interview them, she'd uh, take that knowledge and she'd reconstitute it basically. She'd rebuild it using Adobe Captivate, Articulate Storyline, uh, PowerPoint, whatever tools were available to her. But she couldn't keep up. Um, and I found that most of that content, like she wasn't creating any of it herself, it was coming from the people who had the knowledge, our subject matter experts. And so I said, well, how can I get all of that knowledge and move it without her being a bottleneck in the process? Because it was, it was just taking too long. And so we started experimenting with different ways of doing that. And uh, one of the things we did was like a monthly technology transfer meeting where we'd get on a call, we'd get those subject matter experts on the call. Anybody who was interested from support, from sales, from, from internal groups could get on that call and listen. They would present the new, you know, the new way of doing things, the new feature, the new process that was being introduced. And then these people had a chance to ask questions about it and get clarification. And she would take that and she would capture those videos. Um, and we, we pushed them up onto Skilljar was the tool that we were the platform we were using at the time. And that made it so that, you know, worldwide, all of our employees could access it. And we found that the, the bar of quality expectations was lowered. It, they really didn't care if it was polished. They didn't really care if it was fancy. They didn't care if the videos had bumpers on the front and the end. Uh, what they really cared about is, is the knowledge there that I need. And so uh, we started a process where our instructional designer, instead of being a bottleneck in the flow of information, she became an orchestrator in that flow. Uh, she would just, she would help the SMEs prepare by providing them uh, templates for their PowerPoint decks where they would say, my name is so-and-so, uh, this is my job, this is what I'm going to show you today, uh, at the end of this, here's what you should come away with, and then they would present it. And that put a little bit, you know, Craig was talking about instructional design, the practice of instructional design. Providing that template and that structure and a little bit of coaching really enabled our uh, SMEs to provide the knowledge that uh, they had encapsulated in at least some basic good practices of instructional design, stating what is it that we're, we're going to show you, what are the objectives, uh, and then doing a little bit of follow-up at the end. Then we started taking that content, and they would produce it and put it uh, directly into our learning platform. And so we went from a monthly meeting to more of a bi-weekly cadence using an agile development process where our instructional designer would work with the learners, the consumers, to identify what their needs were, and then she would uh, 
out track the targets. We need something that's gonna address this topic. We need something that's gonna show them how to do this. They need to know X, Y, Z. And then she would present that back to the subject matter experts who had that knowledge. She would schedule sessions and, um, and then they would do the training. They would either create materials or present it. Usually it was just a live Zoom call and she would record it. They're using a, a PowerPoint template that she provided or they're doing a live demo in the application itself. She'd record that and then get it up to, onto the learning platform. So, so that process of, you know, for me, that was the equivalent of drawing lines in the dirt, creating these trenches in the dirt so that then when you take that to scale, it's not just water running all over the place. It's not just content everywhere, everywhere with a lot of duplication and nobody knowing where to find things or, you know, um, or what do we have and what do we need. It kind of provided a structure, sort of like creating a library catalog of what do we need in our learning, you know, in our learning system. And then those things would just fill in and get updated over time through uh, a democratized effort for producing that content. Got it, got it. And and so for everyone listening, so it's this kind of this strategy of of really providing some structure to a certain extent, templates, design guidelines that we would always do on the marketing side of our business. Do that same that same practice so that everybody starts to you know stay in those trenches like Christian's talking about it and kind of. The, the water flows together and seems a little bit more orderly. And now Craig, for you, and again, because you're working with so many different people across the industry, I have to ask about the aggregators because uh, I just came back from the ATD conference and uh, they're all over the place. The, you know, the big ones like a Go One and Biz Library, Open Sesame. Not only do you see them out there talking about these huge libraries of content that you can also incorporate into the model, um, but every one of the vendors, the, the platform vendors are marketing that they've got all of this content available in their platform in one way or another. So is this a, a big piece of the future learning experience model? How do you see those aggregators fitting in nicely alongside the, the stuff that we develop as instructional designers, the things, the, the content that we get contributed from our subject matter experts, and then bringing in some of this um, best of breed content from the aggregators. Where do you see the lines drawn on that? I, I believe that they're going to increase. I think, you know, when you talk to the content aggregators, and there's also two in Europe that, um, and then there's two that are coming out that are not yet full time live, um, you'll see some replication of some of the, the publishers that are in there. And um, there was a vendor called way, way, way back in the early 2000s, Learn.com. And Learn.com started out as an aggregator. They were the only player in town. And then there was Skill, skill Soft, for all intents and purposes, was somewhat of an aggregator. Yes, it was their own content, but it was because they were acquiring all the big platforms of content. So, you know, under the guise there. And um, fast forward today, you know, it was limited audience because if you wanted third-party content or a quote unquote, what's also called off the shelf, you, the client would have to talk to the LMS vendor and they would tell you, you know, hey, I need this and, and that's what they sell. Today, it's visible and I credit Docebo, which is D-O-C-B-O, some people pronounce them as Docebo, it's Docebo. And they were the very first vendor where you could see this marketplace of content that you as the client, not your end users see it, the client sees it, you buy the seats, it's based on seats, um, which some people refer to as licenses, but they're seats, and you could buy a bundle, whatever, or a singular, and boom, it goes in your system. So, you know, when you look at like an aggregator, and to me, it requires multiple publishers, is that, you know, they could have 60, they could have 50, they could have 100. So what happens is, and a lot of learning systems do this, they advertise or market 10,000 assets, 250 courses, as though they're the ones that have put this in. Totally not true. It's coming through aggregators or it's coming through other direct publishers. There are third-party content providers, I'll use that term rather than off the shelf, that do not want to be in an aggregator. There's pros and cons to it. Um, dealing with partnership, you know, uh, numbers. So I believe there's there's two routes to go. You're creating your own content. Then, or you're going to YouTube or whatever you're doing, curation as, as part of your system, and that's a little bit different. 
but then you need to get leadership or you need to get business skills or you need to get something like this. Now, this is common. You know, if you want specific on social justice, that is now available. That wasn't available in, um, you know, pre the, the Black Lives Matter movement. That wasn't available. So, you know, there are changes it, and you're relying on an expertise there. They should be instructionally sound. I've seen some that's not. So it doesn't mean they are. But when you go and look at an aggregator, their model of success, when you talk to them, is what's called an all-you-can-eat model. This is what clients typically buy. So they get access. They buy their seats, um, but the learner gets access to all these courses and all this content. And they go buy a catalog and whatnot. The days of 20 and 50 is available, but that's not what people are buying. And I think this is a, an inevitable ability there are of course pros and cons because what happens with an aggregator is their content or courses depending on your vernacular are only as good as the publishers that are in their platform some push out great content some don't and then they rely on the publishers to cull right remove what's outdated or awful and bring in you know better some do a great job, some don't. And when you're the client, your learners complain and you're having an aggregator, they blame the, the aggregator, like Go One or Open Sesame or whatever, Biz Library, but it's the publishers. Mm -hmm. And that's the game that you have to sort of offset. And I think, you know, I look at um, cord cutters. I'm a cord cutter. And I didn't want to pay the price of, you know, the satellite or whatever. And, and so I jumped over. And I use, uh, I'm open, I use YouTube TV. And then uh, next thing you know, I started buying other things. I buy Netflix 4K, which is, you know, like $21 now. I have Amazon Prime. I have Acorn, which is uh, British television. I have this and that. And, you know, there is people that have looked at this, not me, but there's people looked at it and they're finding that a cord cutter is purchasing on average three of these packages. Now, are they gonna watch all that content? Absolutely not. But it's become that the cable companies are starting to drop their pricing and now they're adding or offering all these other things to go into their system. So, you know, in reality, if you have TV, you're not watching all 400 channels, you're watching a select few and you're relying that you know it's updated or something i mean you know if you want to watch tv land and tv shows from the 70s okay that's fine but you know people are kind of going through these things and it's it's inevitable i think the aggregators personally um i think there are individual content providers their challenge is they can't be seen this is a huge problem in off-the-shelf third-party content their marketing is awful and so if you don't see me you don't know me. And so an aggregator opens that door to get that in there. And if a vendor learning system does a deep integration, which means it's completely in the system, you as the client can say, okay, you know, go one and open Sesame, both do deep, very deep integration. And you go into the platform and then, you know, you're taking it and it goes, it's immediately in the system because of a deep integration. But these are, you know, the challenges of going through. You gain that exposure. And there are off-the-shelf content providers that are both in an aggregator. And then they're, you know, doing the solo kind of piece. I think an aggregator personally gives you greater exposure if you're not known. Um, and you don't really have a, a big enough audience for you because it gains your exposure. The downside is if you're extremely well-known and you're on an aggregator, is you're gonna still get a lot of access. I mean, link. I just want to mention one thing because a lot of people think LinkedIn Learning's an aggregator. They are not an aggregator. I think they have one or two other publishers. They're not an aggregator. And if you go and have a deep integration like with Go One or Open Sesame, you're not gonna see LinkedIn Learning in there. Two factors: one, they have their own platform, and they're coming out with quote unquote an LXP. And then the second thing is that, um, believe it or this is not necessarily public knowledge, but vendors do have challenges with LinkedIn learning. 
um, both in how they, they work with the partners that turns off people. The other thing is that, like I know with Workday, there are some challenges with getting the data back from LinkedIn Learning. And this kind of comes into a piece. And to be honest, LinkedIn Learning has told me repeatedly that they have somebody going through, culling their content, removing the bad content. Look, they add new content, that's very clear, new courses. But I've seen some stuff in there that's just absolutely awful. There's no way they're really fully doing it. And they're not micro learning. I mean, some of this stuff is six, 10, 16 hours. When is that micro learning? Yeah. So, you know, it kind of goes back into where I've seen vendors who have an aggregator and they have, um, they have an integration with the go one and so on and so forth. And you see their back end data, they will tell you and LinkedIn learning is still extremely popular, but I want to buy that. I, I think it's absolutely awful. I mean, you so, might as well just go to YouTube. So Craig, and with your, and I, I think you did a really nice job of kind of framing this around what we're all very comfortable with in our home entertainment, uh, whether it's, uh, an aggregator essentially like a Netflix is no different than what we're looking at here in our in our education space and uh, and and what we're dealing with in in learning development we can access those libraries we can run it alongside everything else and and I and I think it's creating a new world but also with it like you said some some new problems so to shift gears a little bit for you Christian obviously I know you've got background working in the education space as well but what do you see? when you compare what we're doing in corporate L&D and training to the education space, K-12, higher education, the, the methodologies, not necessarily the technology, but on the methodology side, um, are we playing catch up in the corporate world or are there, and are there things we can learn from the other side or uh, is one really ahead of the other? Or are we all just dealing with the same problems in different ways? Yeah, you know, so a few years ago, almost 10 years ago, I had the opportunity to work uh, on personalized learning initiatives in the K-12 space. Uh, so I was working for a platform technology company at the time, uh, but I was flying around the country, uh, all across the U.S., working with uh, primarily people who had received Gates Foundation funding to do innovation in education. And, uh, and there, where there was some component of that where they were trying to enable what was called personalized learning, which meant uh, how do we make it possible for uh, an instructor in a classroom who has 30 students, you know, plus or minus, you know, 10 or 15, uh, to manage uh, a process where each student could get what they needed when they needed it, as opposed to just standing in front of the classroom and, you know, providing content uh, for all students at the same time. And so some of the elements of personalized learning that were part of that model uh, were self-directed, uh, you know, it was really ownership of learning. So it was self-directed learning models where students were setting goals, where students were making choices about the things that they learned. Um, and those choices included uh, perhaps selecting content that was available. You know, maybe I wanted to watch a video or maybe I wanted to read a book or um, uh, or maybe I wanted to listen to a podcast and all of those would meet the same uh, need of providing me input for the thing that I was trying to learn and also making choices about how do I now demonstrate competency? How do I show you, you know, that I can do this thing that I've, that I've acquired the knowledge, that I've acquired the skills, that I've synthesized those. And so students might select from, I want to write a paper or I want to create a video or I want to write a play uh, or I want to, you know, model something out in clay, they would have options. And so some of that, um, I think I am seeing more and more uh, in, in corporate learning. So for me in software development organizations, there's a component of really, I think, motivation and engagement that comes to employees when they have the opportunity to in, increase and improve their skills. When they, when they can you know, make themselves more marketable or learn about new technologies. And so providing them options to choose, providing them uh, ways of expressing or demonstrating competency, uh, stretch projects and things. You know, that's certainly something that I'm seeing in, uh, in corporate learning. Uh, now, I'm, I'm sure Craig would say that a lot of that's been going on for a long time. Um, but I think what, what I'm observing is more of a shift to kind of a broader awareness of the importance of doing that and, uh, and models for doing that in implementation. 
Yeah, and and so I I agree with you too, and I think that a lot of this is as we've talked, you know, amongst the three of us, a lot of these tools have been around, and it's a matter of, of educating people so they understand how to use them the right way. Um, so I've got a couple more questions for you guys because we got a ton of questions that we're going to answer with everyone in our Q and A. Can I respond to that? You may <laughs> respond to that. Yes. I think, uh, and by the way. Um, I taught at a university and had the very first online journalism uh, course in 1999 for the entire system. Um, we used Blackboard, which was the big, they're still the big player. And nobody, by the way, calls them traditional and they've been around for over 20 years. Uh, so let's do that. Okay. So, but the point is, is that the ed tech space, there are some outliers but overwhelmingly deserves a giant F when it comes to their online, their learning systems. They took the model of, I'm in the classroom and let's just shove it online. Um, you have to go linear. You have to go what's called synchronous space. Synchronous space is not about forms and chat rooms. They had that in, and you have that in the corporate L&D and training side. And you always had it. I had it in 2000. Their difference is, is you have, yes, you can pick different activities. And I did, I did projects where people could go and choose an ed tech, but you had to follow a syllabus. It was linear. You can't jump ahead. You can do that in asynchronous based learning where corporate's over 95% that way. The L and D, uh, not the L and D, ed tech is over 90% synchronous. So you can't bounce around and pick and say, you know what, I already know this. I, I want to go in. You can't do that. Now, you can go back for some of them, but everything is locked down. Everything is linear. And that's the same for K-12, and it's definitely the same for higher ed. And so you don't get these things. You have office hours. You have to hope that your teacher or your professor, whoever, is going to respond to that. You have to hope that they're available. I see it today where they have like deadlines. You've got to have it in by midnight in this thing. And if it's not, I mean, this is, there's no difference. And if you look, I'm very passionate about this, but if you look at, you know, people screaming to get back into the classroom, right? Everybody like, and they're all saying uh, in here in the United States, you know, um, this was a failure online, you know, they called it virtual learning, but it's online learning is a failure and it's just horrible and blah, blah, blah. Well, they had two reasons. One, it was a lot of this, which is not interactive. And that's basically in the classroom. And two, because they were following the same format where they had an opportunity to do simulations and they had an opportunity to have scenario and they had an opportunity to think out of the box and go asynchronous and bounce around to really give people, if I, you know, instead of me going through a textbook or basically shoving it online, here's an idea. How would you do it? I mean, they didn't do that. They didn't leverage mobile learning. And so when you don't do these things, people get bored. I don't care how old you are. And many of these systems look like a lab, you know, very sterilized. They don't look fun. I mean, if you're 12 years old, do you want to look at something that's like, you know, totally Boresville? Absolutely not. So, yeah, I'm sorry. The ed tech space discerns a giant F. There were some exceptions. It relies on the school. Look, it's no doubt about it. But the teachers as a whole, I've talked to a lot of teachers, as a whole, they don't like it. They don't get the training. They don't know how to do certain things. So you have a very select few that do a great job, and a lot of them do a horrible job. And especially at the university level, where's this whole kind of learner-centric approach? It doesn't exist. I got to follow a syllabus. How is that any different than me being in the classroom? Okay, that's all I've got to say about it. I appreciate it. I promised the audience that you would be outspoken and blunt with them, and that's that's what we deliver here. So uh, before we jump into Q&A, I have one question for each of you. I will ask it of you, Christian, first, and then Craig. And I think this is important for everybody who's listening from you know both of you because of your your positions in the industry. Five years from now. What does learning experience look like? Christian, tell us. I think it's going to be driven more by learners than it is right now. I, I think of my own learning, the way that I consume uh, new knowledge, the way that I broaden my my perspective and uh, my skill set. 
for the most for the most part I'm doing it on, on my phone I'm I'm doing it while I'm doing other things so when I'm working around the yard working around the house I've got a podcast going or I'm watching YouTube videos um, it's very much uh, on demand for me like this is what I care about this is what I need to know and it's in small bites I'm usually it, if I have uh, a video to watch it better be in a player where I can 1.5 or 2x the thing because I don't want to sit and watch the whole thing. I want to be able to speed it up. I want to be able to scrub it. I want to be able to save it uh, to, to reference it uh, in the future. I want to be able to share it with other people. So other people that, you know, that are part of my organization or other people that I share an interest with, I want to be able to share with them. So we have these tools, you know, in social media and we, we're taking advantage of them in kind of our own individual, in our individually initiated learning activity. Uh, what I see is that that's going to create demand for the organizations within which we work and within which we learn, uh, and they're going to they're going to start offering uh, things more in that format. Give it to me when I want it, uh, in the mode that I want it in, in small bites. Got it. Got it. Thank you. And Craig, same question for you. Five years from now, what does learning experience look like? I wouldn't say five years, I would say 10 years from now, because five years, it's going to look a lot like this now. I mean, you, it all comes down to the client at the end of the day. You can do what you want with the system. If it's you want to play with assigned learning, good for you. You know, if you don't, that's your option. And so the technology uh, in this kind of regard regarding the systems and what they can offer, you know, do is, I think, going to expand. And some of them are going to be very innovative. And the majority are not, you know, it's kind of like the old lemming, you know, philosophy. And, um, you know, there's only a couple of vendors, you know, Christian was talking about sharing. I, I can name on my hand or, you know, on my hand are the number of vendors where you can share content today using WhatsApp, even though WhatsApp has over a billion users. Um, many of them follow Facebook or, you know, there's only there's only a handful that you could put content on Instagram. You know, so there are limitations on, on what can be done, uh, which is a disservice. I, I think it has to be learner centric. Everybody says they're learner centric, which is just not true. And some cutting, you know, technology is really cool. I was really a big fan of VR. Um, it's not there yet. The technology is not there. You got to have the headset, right? There's always a, something you need. So I believe. I'm going to look at it from the client perspective, the person running L&D or training or HR, you know, there's product and what and everybody else, but the main one, L&D and training. I believe if you're a person that believes in innovation and thinking out of the box when it comes to training and learning, and you're willing, I don't care whether you're in financial services or whatnot, and this whole thing about, well, they've got to be... I've met people in financial services. They want to do things that others aren't doing. If you're into that, then you're going to take your learning or training exponentially. If you're not into that and you just want to go steady as it is, steady on the flow, and if it comes into it, maybe use it or not. You know, classroom management is a perfect example. This is seeing a rise, even though the majority of people are in a hybrid or they're working from home. They're not going to go physically on site. And yet vendors are adding these things based on demand or what they perceive as demand. And so it comes down. It, I know people that still use file folders and they're on a learning system. Now, they're not going to change on there. Um, now, I'm going to say something and I'm sure I'll probably get eviscerated. But <laughs> as a whole, you know, CLOs are not what I consider as a whole very innovative um, or very thinking. They've got a strong OD background, which is cool, you know, leadership and development and everything else. And I don't care. This has nothing to do with age because I know people in their 20s that don't use mobile devices, not every, you know, use a smartphone. And then I know people that are high age, you know, that, that go about and do this. So, you know, it does come back to the person and, and it's a drill down. If you have a CEO at a company that buys into e-learning and all its powers, that drills down and you get buy-in everywhere else. If you have somebody who does not see that, you're, you're facing, you know, from an employee standpoint, a much bigger challenge. And, and so I think this is where it's going to continue. 
you know, more and more vendors I talk to are now communicating also directly with the CEO of companies. That is new. That's never happened before at this level. And so there is a definite interest because COVID, for all the awful things that have happened, the one, you know, what you call, you know, what's come out of it is that more and more people need a system. And as a result, they need the consumption of the content. They need the curation of the content. They want to go where they recognize about a hybrid model and, and all these other kinds of things. And, you know, I always say this to people. Pre-COVID is gone. Throw that in a trash can. Whatever you were doing pre-COVID, throw that in a garbage bill. Welcome to new reality. And that's what's going forward. And if you end up with a Delta variant, you know, something else, you have to kind of be able to adapt. And that's where I think the industry and people as a whole are going to need to do is they, they have to adapt and innovate and think differently, um, which benefits their learners, employees or, or customers or members. Great point. Great point. And I, and I think what you touched on is important for everyone to remember that, you know, whatever we were pre-COVID has changed forever now. We've seen even five years or more worth of adoption happen in a year and a half. And everybody's got a platform of some form or another. Everyone has a need for it. So great point. Um, thank you guys for all the, the comments on that. I'd like to, um, Stephanie, I don't know if you want to queue up some questions for us or if you want me to go through them, but we've got a number of questions from our, our audience and we've got some time here to answer them. If you guys are, Craig, Christian, you're game for some off the cuff questions here from our audience. Let's do it. All right. Sure. Um, let's see, John, why don't we start out with what are your thoughts about subject matter experts trying to direct the design and delivery strategies for learning experiences? Are instructional designers being phased out? Are subject matter experts now in the role of instructional designers? Christian, you want to take that? You, you kind of spoke about that a bit earlier. Yeah, no, so I would say that it's the instructional designers who are going to orchestrate that. You know, they're best positioned to do that. And it's a way of leveraging, you know, leveraging your skill set um, but doing it at scale. So I, I wouldn't think it was the, it's the subject matter experts, but if the instructional designer can say, here are the learning needs and provide uh, you know, a framework and a process for getting that knowledge to flow without coming you know, through the, the traditional process, you're gonna be able to move a lot more knowledge more quickly. All right, here is uh, maybe a good one for Christian as well. Do you see e-learning being phased out and moving towards video-based learning? Christian or so, Craig, whoever wants yeah, to jump on that. Yeah, Craig, I'm sure you, you probably have some thoughts there too. I, I'm assuming in this case that e-learning is going to refer to interactive learning, the kind of thing that you're going to build with Lectora, that you're going to build with Storyline, where it's more interactive and you're moving through it. Um, I would say that it depends. What I think we'll see is that we have a lot more tools available to us now and we can use the right tool for the right job. So I, I, I my best source of, uh, of knowledge here is looking at what our customers are doing with, the, with our technology and other technology. So VR, for example, Craig made the point that that's a pretty big investment. You gotta get headsets, you gotta get hand controllers, you, all this stuff to do. I'm amazed at how many people are making that investment. A lot in, in pharma, a lot in other industries where, where that type of interaction just really makes a difference in the richness of the learning experience and the outcomes that they see. Um, but it's important to recognize that it's an option that's available. And so I think people are gonna use the tools that are, are available. So a lot of it's probably gonna go to video, a lot of it's probably gonna go to what you can quickly create, but some of it you really need higher levels of engagement and interactivity. So I don't think e-learning ever, is ever going to completely be phased out and go away. Hey, can can I wanna, yeah, can why I don't you answer all about YouTube too? Cause I think you got a perspective on that. Who's that? Craig, for you, Craig, for you. Oh, okay. So just briefly about video learning platforms have actually been around, been around since 2009, um, which was 100% video. And some had a net, a matter of fact, going back to Workday Learning, they acquired one. So their system, then when they rolled that out, that was actually a massive chunk was MediaCore, which is video learning platform. Panopto stays with it. Um, many of them kind of, you know, kind of hybrid out. I think, you know, look, 
video learning is just another another delivery format and what bothers me the most is that um, it is slowly changing and it's based on the system by the way where you can have video bookmarking and you can have search and you can use a search and then it goes right to where that person is speaking those words or that sentence or thing um, numerous systems have this and um, and so uh, I think that's the, the piece so you can bounce around you have these kinds of things but most of these videos is nothing more than you know the days of you when you were onboarded and you were put into a, a you know a room and they shoved in a VCR tape a VHS tape and then they left you um, that's all it is and so you have to hit stop and you have to do these kinds of things and the days of people watching a 30 minute video is gone. So unless it's super interesting and whatever, most of it is like me talking with a fake background in there, or I'm dressed up in a suit and you're in a suit and uh, you know, we're at a retail, which nobody's doing. So, you know, there is limitations I think on that. So the bookmarking piece is whatever. I want to mention one thing. There was a speaking about out of the box cutting edge. There was a vendor called Playback Media. They do not, they're not the same vendor that's here today. And in 2000, they launched a series of video courses that ran. Uh, I was living in Boston at the time, and uh, the modem speed I was getting was 38K, which is deadly. Nobody would be on that today. And it streamed beautifully. And they had scenarios. And you could bounce around. They had a bookmarking capability. They had a SCORM. And you could bounce around and do things. They were so far advanced than everybody else that, you know, they went, uh, they got acquired and then they, you know, went out of business. But, you know, so there has been people that have tried these things and go into. And I think when you're creating video-based learning, I don't care if it's three minutes or five minutes. If it's boring, it's boring. And people will, you know, try to jump ahead, oops, excuse me, and get to those points. So you need the bookmarking capability. You need to go more of, of tracking that's in there. And there are systems today, you can take a video without buying and using an authoring tool, and you upload it, and it automatically converts to a SCORM 1.2 wrapper. That is what you need. And I think you really want that search functionality if I say banana, it goes right to banana or I highlight or whatever, that's where you can get into. But I agree, look, asynchronous based learning, which is what we're talking about uh, as relates to e-learning, as I referred to in the corporate, is where I, I can bounce around and focus. And I would just say this is people are going to, you know, we focus a lot about retention, comprehension, retention. The end game is not that. It's synthesis. And so I'm going to build synthesis based on something I'm interested in, it, right? Nobody reads the entire newspaper. Nobody reads an entire magazine anymore. They focus on what they're interested in. So how is that different than learning and training? And when you do that, then you're going to get that synthesis that everybody uh, wants. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, Christian. Yes. Stephanie, do we have time for one more question? Are we at the end of our time here? We are at the end. So thank you everyone so much for attending this webinar. Craig, Christian, John, thank you for your time. Uh, we've had a lot of great feedback in the questions panel about how interesting this has been. Now I will do my one last little marketing thing. eLearning Brothers has the Rockstar Learning Platform, which is an awesome learning platform that you can get a free account of. It did recently rank on Craig Weiss's top 100 LMS lists. So if you're interested in that, you can visit elearningbrothers.com and you can look forward to the recording in your email tomorrow. Thank you everyone so much for joining us today. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you, Craig. Thanks, Christian. Thanks,